Hi, everybody. So you're about to meet the smartest 35-year-old you've ever met in your life. Where is she? <laughs> <laughs> so May May went to the University of Pennsylvania undergrad, then decided to go to Harvard for her um, to get her law license, law degree, and now is the CEO of a biotech company. I trudged along like a normal kid who just wanted to be a doctor and stayed in this channel. Can you explain to me your wacky path to success? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, and a stop at McKinsey. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if you had told me at seven that I would be in biotech, I would have said absolutely not. It was, because? Um, well, truth be told, my, my family was in biotech. So my mother uh, is a scientist, and she and my father started a biotech company basically at the same time I was born. So he was kind of like a little brother to me growing up, and I was pretty resentful of that. <laughs> uh, so basically, I wanted to have absolutely nothing to do with it. So I didn't take any science courses. In fact, I'm kind of proud that I got through college without taking any science courses, and even <laughs> biology to this day. Um, and so I went you know, to economics and law. And the problem was that I just, it wasn't meaningful. You know? um, I love the people that I work with, but there wasn't like, something that I was passionate. And I remember one Christmas as a uh, vacation, I was in Shanghai with my parents, and I was at McKinsey at the time. And um, there was kind of this business thing that came up for them. And it was really over the dinner table that I was like, you know, maybe I can help you with that problem. Were they struggling? Um, you know, I think they're both hardworking and brilliant people, um, but sometimes you need a different skill set to convert. And so they were having trouble converting. If I asked your parents today, did May May save the company, what would they say? Uh, <laughs> what do you say? You know, I didn't save the company. I didn't, you know, I think it's a team effort. I think where we are today has to do with everyone. Um, and so... But you must, have, you must have known in that moment you were playing a very pivotal role. Yeah, I think definitely. I think I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think that I could play that pivotal role. Um, or at least lend something that they were missing at the time. So we were highly complementary. And what started out with a six-month project to kind of you know, right the ship uh, turned into a couple of years um, as a job. And you know, it's almost a decade later. And now it's become my life. Like I can't think of anything that I would rather be doing. So you've made a very brave stand into neurosciences. There are no great Alzheimer's drugs on the market. I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. But you have come up and your scientific team with an idea of a vaccine to prevent Alzheimer's. Game changer. I mean, game changer. So would you please explain the science to me? Because we think of vaccines like to raise antibody levels, to mm -hmm. take care of infectious diseases. You're using a very different term that people don't really think of. Yeah, no, we're trying to reinvent the idea of a vaccine. So, you know, a lot of people don't know. Everyone's like, oh, you know, the world is terrible. But in reality, you know, things are pretty good. We're in this health revolution. Um, we've actually doubled our life expectancy in the last 100 years alone. And a major part of that has been both sanitation and vaccines. So we're really good at developing vaccines against infectious diseases, so things that are on the outside. So we can train our body to fight those things. The problem now is that most of us are dying from chronic diseases. So it's like 70% of people have chronic diseases, and it accounts for more than 80% of the healthcare costs. The problem with vaccination as a concept is that our bodies are really smart, and they don't like to attack themselves. That's autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So it's been really tricky to develop a vaccine technology to get your body to develop antibodies to fight you know, these neurotoxic proteins. So if the idea is you get proteins are laid down in your brain, you get these tangled webs, your vaccine would tell the body, don't let those proteins flip on and make those tangled webs. Yeah, kind of like that. So we, we have a... <laughs> that is putting me back in my heels. Okay, smarty pants, continue. <laughs> so, I'm also not a scientist, so I'm going to do it. You're faking it really in, well. <laughs> in terms that I can understand. Um, so, you know, we produce proteins all the time, our body does. And at some point in life, you know, some of these proteins misfold or they become abnormal. And in the case of Alzheimer's, for instance, there's one protein called amyloid. And once it misfolds later in life, it begins aggregating and becoming these plaques, and they, they decorate our brain and end up killing our neurons, more or less. 
Um, so what our vaccine technology does is it teaches your body to produce antibodies against those plaques. So it teaches your body and makes it into a drug factory, basically. And it takes those, those endobodies that we call them because they're against an endogenous thing that your, your own self produces. And uh, it makes sure that you know, they try not to, to accumulate and or this, you take them out. This drug is now in phase two clinical trials with the FDA. Yeah, we just finished uh, our phase two, so we're wrapping up. And so that means it's shown safety, it's shown efficacy, and you're ready for stage three. Uh, it's definitely safe. That's one of our hallmarks. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to show efficacy. We already have initial suggestions, but you know, fingers crossed. We I'm blind in a few weeks. Um, but you know, one thing is that this technology is proven. So unlike other vaccine technologies against endogenous proteins, we uh, we cut our teeth in animal health. So this is a proven thing, and we actually license one of only four vaccines against an endogenous protein, it turns out to be this immunocastration vaccine for swine. It's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> try selling that to the American public. <laughs> uh, <laughs> try telling your boyfriend at the time that your mother invented something that cuts males' balls off. <laughs> <laughs> so. How did you take it? Uh, we're married now. <laughs> 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 And you procreated, so obviously he's still intact. <laughs> yeah, although every time there's a pin, he's like. <laughs> no, that's funny. At what age did you know, and I really mean this, at what age did you know you were smart? I've never known a leader who didn't know that aha moment, where there was childhood or young adulthood, where he thought, I, I can own this space. You know, it's funny you say that, because I actually think that feeling or thinking that I was smart has been one of the biggest challenges and uh -huh. barriers from actually succeeding. So, you know, I grew up in a Chinese household, so, you know, everyone tells you, oh, you're smart. You know, you're like, you know, <laughs> they want you to be, right? And, and your mom was a biochemist. Your dad was, came out of the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, education was very important, right? My mother uh, was one of the first Asian grad students, female grad students at Rockefeller. So, you know, she was a great role model in terms of um, being a high achiever. Um, and so there was always this pressure to perform and achieve growing up, and it was always like, you're smart, so you have to. And the problem was is that, you know, if you failed at something, what does that mean? Does that mean you're not smart? Mm. And, you know, for a lot of my life, it was, especially growing up, it was, you know, challenging because I didn't want to put it all in, put it out there, try new things, because I was afraid that if I failed, then it would be a reflection of me not being smart and then being disappointed. And interesting that you're in such a high-risk uh, arena in medicine where you take big risks, fail big, keep going, et cetera. I mean, it's how, I mean, you and I know that in the United States right now, I worry that we're becoming a scientifically illiterate nation and the more wealth, the wealthier, the whiter, the lower the vaccination rates. How do you plan on explaining this to people so they prophylactically get a vaccine? Um, well, if you were in the situation, and let's say you had a choice of taking Alzheimer, getting Alzheimer's or having a vaccine uh, maybe once a year to prevent it, what would be the choice? People don't get their flu shots. That's true. Um, but 800,000 people. flu shot isn't particularly effective. And ah. <laughs> Sorry. That's true. <laughs> I don't get I my flu shot. I still get it. Oh, you don't? I <laughs> I mean, here's the idea. So this is how we envision um, vaccination in the future, right? And it's not too far off. Um, so right now we go into, you know, for annual checkups and we get our cholesterol and other, you know, blood sugar levels and all this stuff. And the doctor says, okay, you know, maybe your cholesterol is too high. You know, we'll get, put you on some medication to, to lower it. Right now we don't have that visibility into the brain. Right. But that's coming and that's the ecosystem. And that's actually where, you know, as part of that ecosystem, I realized you can't do it alone. We can't just be developing drugs. We have to be developing, you know, biomarkers to be able to see how well the drugs are working. So imagine, you know, in the future, you go in and instead of just getting your cholesterol, you have your brain number. And then the doctor can say, hey, you know what, your, maybe your A beta level is too high, maybe your tau level is too high. Let's vaccinate you and keep that in check. And so the idea is prevent these things from ever happening. Alzheimer's is not a disease that happens overnight. It accumulates right. Right. 20, 30 years. And in your pipeline, you also are looking at things for Parkinson's and yep. migraines. So the brain is the new frontier in medicine. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're, I don't want to say we're, we're curing, but it's Alzheimer's is the only disease in the top 10 that's rising. 
every year. So that is, that's going to be the next major battle for our health. One final question before we leave the stage. I told you we could have talked for 30 minutes. Um, what books are on your book stand? Uh, right now, I have uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck, uh, Principles by Ray Dalio, and uh, oh, this is terrible, but um, I just read a finished reading book about North Korea. So, May May, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.